I would like to happily introduce Bach Wiers, who will tell us something about Ansible and uh, okay, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Bach, the stage is yours. So I'll explain why I am doing a talk about Windows. <coughs> Actually, it's uh, Jan Piet's fault. Ah, because I didn't want yeah, to do it. I, don't, I didn't think it was, it was going to be very interesting for the audience. But uh, yeah, he wanted to see. Well, I actually wanted to talk what I'm doing at Cisco. I work for Cisco now as a freelance. And it also includes Windows. So that's the, the, the main reason why I'm not doing so much with Windows myself. Because I didn't use Windows for 22 years, except for helping my girlfriend or family members with Windows. But I, I, I switched to Linux in 1995 or something, when I started in university. And uh, yeah, I never regretted it either. So, um, yeah, so I'm a freelance Linux consultant. Um, yeah. And the, the most important thing to get out of this is that I work for Cisco now because it's, it's, uh, it is a use case that uh, I will explain as well. So, Ansible and Windows. So, I usually try to avoid doing Windows stuff. Uh, my girlfriend really tells people that I don't do computers, I do do Windows because I spend too much time on trying to fix things for people. Uh, especially if they, they tell me, yeah, it's something that nobody can fix and uh, it's something that I would like to do. <laughs> um, but so I don't do Windows normally, except when my kids went to school. Uh, at the elementary school, it's Windows. And uh, you, you could try to get Linux working on those machines and, and get all the teachers against you if you want to. But they were using Windows, it was all kinds of versions of Windows. And uh, because they didn't have any IT personnel uh, and it was a real mess, uh, I started helping them. So that is one of my use cases. Also, I help people uh, with Windows, my friends, my family. Um, and then it helps to also do that with Ansible, for instance, because you don't have to repeat the same stuff all over again. Um, and that's Cisco, that's actually how I started working on Ansible on Windows. I did a little bit at the elementary school, but obviously it's free time. I didn't spend that much time on improving Windows with Ansible. But once I uh, accepted uh, a job, well, a job, uh, a mission at Cisco, and this was actually very complex infrastructure. You had, had to set up, um, actually you had to reproduce customer cases with specific technology. In this case, Cisco ACI, if people know what this is. It's a new, um, networking stack of Cisco is a new network, so some sort of methodology uh, of Cisco. And they, obviously because it's a networking component that is very high level, it, it interfaces with a lot of other technology. Um, and so it's, it's very complex to set things up with ACI, because you normally do it only once at the company. And in our case, if you have to reproduce customer cases, it's nice to be able to repeat that often, because you can spend a lot of time. So the second use case I will go into to detail as well after the presentation, after the, the, the presentation that I used to do. Um, but first, let's look at Ansible and Windows. So why is Ansible actually a good fit for Windows? You know that Ansible, it doesn't have a daemon. It uses native technology. Actually, we do the same thing for Windows. So on Windows, we also use Winagam, which is the native way of talking to, to a Windows machine, it's a, it's a protocol from Microsoft. And we use PowerShell, which is the native, uh, well, scripting language of, of, uh, of Windows. And using those two, you have actually the same advantages that you have with Ansible on Unix. Uh, you can automate whatever is available. There is one thing that I want to say about both of them. When I am, it's, 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 it comes from Microsoft. Uh, it's not a very well-designed protocol. It has a lot of overhead, it's slow. Um, and so Microsoft has been telling for a few years now that they are going to ship SSH as part of Windows. And it's, it's possibly coming with, uh, with uh, Windows uh, Server 2016 with the service pack, possibly. They have, they have open SSH running on Windows for a long time now in a uh, GitHub project, so it's, it's open source, you can see what they did, and it's, it's looking quite well. There are some, some issues now still, but uh, it, it's, it seems almost ready to, to, to ship with Windows. And that would be, for us, much better. It would be a better solution than using Winagam. But as long as it's not native for Windows, it doesn't 
it doesn't help us a lot because other people have to install it and stuff like that. And it's not that easy to install it, it's not, it doesn't ship with it. And then with PowerShell, why not Python? Python works on PowerShell uh, on the Windows as well. Well, the problem is that a lot of the automation that already exists uh, for Windows, it's PowerShell. It's not in Python. In Python, you don't have a lot of libraries for Windows for managing uh, com objects and stuff like that. So it, it doesn't make sense to, 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 to also look at improving Python libraries to work better with the Windows ecosystem. So PowerShell is a, is a, is a perfect fit. It's not a perfect fit for Ansible because Ansible only, well, it doesn't only support Python, but most of the stuff is very Python oriented. Um, so a lot of, well, a lot of things, uh, various things have to, 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 to be changed to support PowerShell in this, in this regard. Um, and that will probably not change soon. But OpenSSH, would, of SSH itself, would probably be the, the, the future for, uh, for Ansible with Windows. Nevertheless, it works well with Windows, but it's <coughs> not the fastest way to do so. So, agentless using existing standards, so that's, uh, that's the important stuff. Then, also what's important is with Ansible you can also manage all the systems. It's not only just the latest, it's the same for Windows. So we, we, we still support up to, up from Windows 7 until uh, the latest stuff for desktop. And for Windows Server, it's starting from 2000, Windows 2008. But you need to have a, a newer PowerShell. At least PowerShell 3.0, but some modules use newer objects that didn't exist in PowerShell 3.0. So if we, we advise to actually use PowerShell 5 uh, for, if you don't want to hit any of those things. Um, and it's actually quite easy to upgrade even the older Windows with the, the latest uh, PowerShell. Um, for authentication, you have a lot of possibilities, and actually, I would, if you're interested in this, look at the documentation. The documentation is, we, we revised the documentation in the development version of the documentation, and it's quite good. It was one of the things that we've been working on for a long time. Um, the, uh, I don't see it up there. Uh, let's see if I can show it like this. Yeah, I have, I'm a big consumer of stuff. <laughs> um, if you look at the, the link here, if you normally go to the documentation, you end up at the latest documentation, which means, so instead of double here, you will see latest. If you now look for Ansible Windows, you, you, you won't see this stuff. And the latest actually means the latest stable, so you see the documentation for version 2.4. Now, most of this documentation that has been improved it had, did not hit version 2.4. Uh, Yes, so it will only ship with version 2.5, but if you're interested in the Windows documentation that works with version 2.4, it's better to look at the development documentation and not the, the one that you're forwarded to automatically. Um, and that's also the same for other stuff. So if you're working with the development version, don't use the normal latest uh, URL, replace latest with that. And it, it will really help you with, uh, with finding information about the latest stuff. Especially because the new functionality always comes with new documentation. So if you don't find new documentation or something new, you're probably looking at the wrong documentation. And this is also something new, eh? this change with version 2.4 that we have version documentation. Which also brings in uh, other complexities like backporting documentation, which is something that people don't like to do, but it's still very important. Um, if you look here, let me quickly show you for authentication options. It's important to know that it's not all authentication options give you the same privileges. Very important because this is something that often goes wrong. People use basic authentication but then cannot do, uh, I think basic authentication doesn't allow you to delegate credentials so you cannot access shares on, 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 on Windows, on, on the network. Um, and it doesn't offer you encryption. Um, so what, what we're using is always CRED SSP. Uh, in the lab environment we do have Active Directory um, because we set it up ourselves for every individual uh, lab pod, but um, we target, we use CRED SSP with local admin accounts for most of the stuff we do. Except if it's needed, then we use, uh, we use, actually we also use CRED SSP, but we use the, the Active Directory credentials. We don't use Kerberos itself uh, within, uh, within our own Ansible Windows setup. But you can, it, it works, but in our lab setup we don't need it. 
Um, Credit SSP allows everything, just like Kairos does. Only Kairos obviously doesn't do local accounts, so I think Credit SSP is the, the best way to do the authentication. And it's explained in the documentation how to do that. I'm not going, going to go over these details because the documentation is so good. Um, it explains everything you need to know, everything that the uh, certificates, NTLM, Kairos, everything is explained. Um, let's see, where is my. The problem is that the, the screen is on the left, but on my thing it's on the right. So, documentation, very important. Let's see. Um, the, the nice thing about Ansible on Windows, and it's something that for Windows people I think is, is the, the, the real nice thing, is that it introduces idempotency, which is not something that exists in the Windows world, not, not like how Ansible is doing it. And it also introduces check mode and diff support. If you use the, I um, can't remember what the Microsoft way of doing configuration management is. Configure. Yeah, you, it, it works differently, obviously. It's all GUI based and, and you don't have those, uh, those, those things. Um, in PowerShell, there is something called what if. So a lot of the, the PowerShell um, commentlets have an option what if, and if you say what if you set it to true, it's something like, check mode. It doesn't do it, but it pretends to do it. The only thing is, we enabled it, if you do a check mode, and most of these commentlets will enable what if support, but we noticed that it doesn't add anything. It doesn't do everything that it would be checking before running it, it just doesn't run it. <laughs> so we hope that at some point in the future, Microsoft discovers that they could do more with what if support, and they would also test certain stuff before that could fail before running it, so that we also automatically have that advantage. But we use the what if support, but it doesn't seem to offer anything at the moment. Maybe it's it's uh, it's foreseen, but nobody uses this, uses it. So, uh, and then there is another thing that often is asked to uh, us: uh, Can we run Ansible on Windows? At the moment, it doesn't work out of the box. Not natively on Windows, you can use, uh, for instance, um, um, uh, WSL, uh, what is it called? It's, it's called Bash on, on Windows, it's, uh, but it's actually Linux. So it's not really running on Windows, it's the Windows kernel, but actually underneath everything is, is Linux. It's a, it's a glibc, it's a, it's a shell, it's, it's actually a, a Linux distribution with a Windows kernel in my opinion. But it doesn't run natively in in, uh, in, in PowerShell, for instance. And uh, this is possible. And I will come back in the, in the second presentation. We're, we're, we're implementing um, uh, multi thread support, and with multi thread support, this becomes possible. The problem now is forking new, new uh, processes, which works differently on, on Windows. <laughs> um, no. Um, the problem is, how do you start with Ansible on Windows? That's a, that's a good question. Um, I, I've, I have an issue open on, on possible possibilities. At the moment, you have to enable WinAM. You can do it by hand. Um, and usually, people do it by hand. And maybe you have to upgrade PowerShell. If you have Windows 10, you don't have to. Uh, for Windows 7, I think you have to. For Windows 7 um, Service Pack 1, I think it's already shipped with PowerShell 3. So in most cases, you don't have to upgrade PowerShell, but it's better to do it. Um, but we created a, a module called bin underscore ps execute, and actually I wrote this for Cisco. Before we had Becom support in Windows, there was no way to run something as a different user or to, to escalate your privileges. And with bin ps execute, you could actually run things in non-interactive mode, or in interactive mode, or as a system user, or with privileges. So using this tool, you could do it. But you require to have at least one Windows system that already has WinAgam enabled because WinPS Execute actually runs PS Execute.exe, which, co which comes from system kernels. Uh, and so you need a Windows system to run it. But you have to delegate it to that system to run something on another system. That was possible. And this is then, this you could use to upgrade the power to a new PowerShell, and you could use this to enable WinAgam. So one, once you have one system, Windows system available, you could use this to enable WinRAM and PowerShell and start using Ansible without having to have anything done on that system itself. 
obviously you need the administrative credentials. And it actually uses the, um, the remote execution, uh, what is it called? The, you know you have a hidden drive, it's not really a hidden drive, but you have a hidden share that, that, that you so can same, use. So the hackers use. Yeah, it's the same thing as the hackers use. And actually one thing I would like to do is I would like to implement a Python-based version of this PS execute so that we can run it directly from, from Unix. Or in, um, implement this, uh, this PS execute functionality or as a transport. Because then we don't need to use WinRAM either. It has some uh, limitations, but for just enabling this, it would be nice. Because then you can just kick, kick start everything without even having to log on to systems and enable something. If you look at the GitHub issue, uh, you will see a lot of the things that, that I've been discussing. If we're going to implement it, that's, uh, that's it's not that easy to do. So it's maturing fast. Um, when I started at Cisco, a lot of things were not possible. Uh, we started a Windows um, working group, and we started to do weekly meetings, started to create a to-do list, uh, started to prioritize stuff, which enabled a lot of things, I think. Because once we started to do that, it was obvious that uh, the, the maintainer of the Windows part um, had other priorities within Ansible, and at some point, someone else was hired who also worked full time on Windows, and the two of them are really doing an incredible job. Um, so, that's what version 2.3 pipelining was introduced, Kerberos support was introduced, we improved the Windows API, uh, and we refactored most modules because I, before I started with this, most of the modules didn't have check mode support and none had a diff support. And uh, now almost all of the modules have check mode support, and some have this support. In most cases, it doesn't make sense, but with some of them, it's, it's very useful. For instance, if you make changes to the registry, this is something where you really would like to see what was there before and what, what has changed. Even if you don't make a change, you would still want to see this. Um, and then with Ansible version 2.4, we introduced DSC support. I don't know if people actually, is someone using Windows for work? Is some, somebody interested in this for? Yes. Okay, perfect. <laughs> Two. <laughs> yes. But we are still running on Ansible 2.2 or something. Yeah, so it's sometimes a fight. <laughs> yeah, if you're using Tower properly, you can use this. But DSC support, if you know a little bit of Windows, uh, all of the Windows engineers tell me, why well, you shouldn't be using your own stuff in open source. Microsoft has a perfect solution, and DSC is the perfect solution. So DSC stands for Desired State Configuration, and it's actually a little bit similar to what all the configuration management tools are doing. You simply state what, how you would like the system to be. And these modules exist, they are written in PowerShell, and with the WinDSC uh, module, it becomes a native Ansible module, it, it seems. So you simply say with WinDSC, I want to run this module from, uh, from the DSC library, and then you provide all the information from that uh, DSC module. And then it just do, does it for you, and you get also back when there's something changed. I don't know if check mode support is in there. I, didn't, I, I never used it myself, but uh, I, I should verify it. But that would be nice as well. Since version 2.4, we have become support, which was very, very needed. Otherwise, you cannot, in my case, if I have to manage desktops, I cannot change desktop related stuff if I cannot become that user. That's not possible. And since Ansible version 2.5, you can also become the system user, which has some additional uh, privileges that the normal user doesn't have, which is also very, very nice. Before this existed, and before even become support existed, the only way to have uh, elevated privileges was using WinPS execute, but then you have to go to another machine to, to access it. Um, or you had to run, use scheduled tasks. And it's very, very strange. Apparently in the Windows world, it's a normal way of escalating or, or, or elevating privileges is create a task, state that it has to be in interactive mode and state that it has to have, uh, needs to run a system or whatever other user, and then wait until it finishes, then read out the result and then give it that back uh, or do something with it. And it's really, really strange because all of these PowerShell scripts or all of these batch files, they, they use the, the, the scheduler the task scheduler for, for running something elevated is really, really strange. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, 
Then, in Ansible version 2.4, we also, we also introduced something like module utils for PowerShell um, modules. Before that, we had one big library that was included in all the modules, and it provided stuff like, um, um, how is it called now? Exit, exit JSON and exit, exit, no, fail JSON. Uh, those, those functionality also to have the arguments back, the parameters for a module. You have to list them somehow. We had a function that did this for us. Um, it's not, it, it's going to be improved in version 2.5 as well. We'll probably have a proper object model for that modules can include, just like for the Python modules. And it will probably be identically uh, constructed with the same names so that they very much look the same. But at the moment, it's not done. It's not also not a priority because it, it basically works, although we don't have all the functionality that the Python modules have. And we also started to create integration tests for the modules because a lot of these modules, they worked for some use cases, but if you then provide a different input or you want to do something else, it would flat out fail. So uh, integration tests also improved the Windows support a lot. Um, I, think, I think 80 or 90% of the modules now have integration tests, and the ones that don't have it are probably modules that are not that often used. Um, then for Ansible version 2.5, um, a few things are coming. I already told you the become support for system, and I saw, see this misspelled, interactive support. Um, I don't know if this will be in version 2.5. Um, the problem is that in PowerShell you have five different types of output. You have debug output, you have um, um, error output, standard outputs. So you have five different output levels, and we only have two. And so Ansible was only created to have those two. Um, so some of the output is just lost. We don't do anything with it, and we should probably do something with it. And that's probably going to be changed in Ansible, that all, also these different other output levels are being shown, depending on how many Vs you provide. Um, and that's going to be important for, for the Windows people. Windows Nano Server support is going to be added so that we test everything for Windows Nano. Um, and I also wanted to have Windows 10 support added, but uh, that, that is not that much interested in when you're not testing against Windows 10 ourselves. Um, let me see what is still, I already told you about SSH. Ah, platform support is also going to be added in version 2.5. And platform support, the problem now is, that if you say that a system uses WinRAM as the default connection method, it's assumed that you also are using PowerShell. So you cannot um, indicate that you want to use SSH with, 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 with uh, PowerShell, for instance, which is already possible if you install SSH yourself. You have to do the dirty trick to make that work. And the platform support is actually, you can then say, uh, you can define a platform which states this is the combination between this, uh, this transport with this uh, shell, that, or, or with this uh, scripting language, these two together will then define the platform and you can say for this uh, system, this is the combination I want to use. Uh, I don't know exactly how it will look like, I don't know if it's already, I know that they have been working on it, but I haven't seen a proposal, a design proposal. And this is something that uh, Ansible is now trying to do better. It, we had identified in, in San Francisco that a lot of the new stuff being developed is developed internally with, without anyone of the community even knowing what is happening. Uh, and this mostly the networking, network developers, which is now a very huge part of, of Ansible, um, they're, they're really doing stuff for themselves, even though a lot of that stuff is actually useful also for the broader Ansible uh, ecosystem. And um, we discovered at, at, San, at San Francisco, at the Ansible Fest, that um, and they, they were really proud of what they did. They, they were showing us what they, what, what they did and what they were going to announce at Ansible Fest the next day. And we were really shocked that a lot of these things were developed only for networking without thinking about use cases outside of the networking space. Uh, I'm, I'm going to come back on this in the next presentation. Um, but that meant that, uh, yeah, nobody was really happy with it, even Reddit people or Ansible people themselves. And uh, when we discussed this, it was really clear that we need to have 
we need to follow the proposal process also for Ansible people itself, even though it's a drag because they can discuss something in a meeting and just do it. Now they will have to make a proposal. They will have to uh, discuss with community people uh, and also with other people within Ansible. And so that's going to make, uh, maybe we have to cut that up from the, <laughs> from the stream. <laughs> but, uh, well, this is internally, it, it doesn't really matter because it was discussed in the community, but it's obviously, it's not nice to, to, uh, to have to see this still happening in a, but it makes sense because some of these functionality are actually uh, done because customers really want this and even pay for it. So, yeah, what do you do, eh? So, um, why, why was I saying all this? Why was I saying all this? I don't remember. Because the number of modules different are platform support. Yeah, to, how they got uh, it. Uh, yeah, there was a, a reason for it, I don't remember. But I will come back to it in the next uh, presentation. Um, the thing is that, ah, the thing is that now, um, we have a proposal process and we can see how things look like and we can still discuss the user interface because I think that's the most important part. Engineers not necessarily think about how users have to interact with something and how, how this affects the, the common playbook design and stuff like that. There are a lot of examples where I think we could do better if we have more inputs from more people. That's it. Um, something that I was telling young people uh, in, in and now the development branch, we have a new Win update support. It was it only hit the repository, I think, uh, two days ago. And the nice thing about the new window update support, the old window update support used uh, scheduled tasks <coughs> um, because it requires special privileges. But now that we have become support, which is which works properly, um, we have implemented with update support. What does it do? It just updates your system. It, it, it checks what are the the outstanding updates and it, if you specify you also want to reboot it will also reboot and bring the system back and the nice thing about it is it will also do uh, the, the, the next updates if there are still updates and then reboot again and it can do that a few times until all updates are done with a single task and this is something I, I've been managing desktops for for some time and this is something that I needed for a long time because it takes a lot of time to always have to say yes, pre perform these updates and then wait for the reboot and do it again. I hope it would reboot only once after all. Yeah, the, preferably it doesn't have to reboot or maybe only once, but at least this helps you to, to yeah, it's, it's, a, it's an abstraction layer for doing updates and reboots. Um, <coughs> the number of Windows modules has been uh, going through the roof. <coughs> Although for version 2.5 we don't see that many uh, new modules anymore, so I think somehow we we have the most important uh, modules now available. I think there are three still in the pipeline, of which Win certificate is probably the most interesting one. Win XML <laughs> is, a, is a Windows version of the XML module, which is also interesting for enterprises, but the Win certificate is really something you often have to do uh, if you're doing complex stuff. With SCVMM or uh, or MSSQL or things like that. Um, so we have quite some modules for Windows. And what are these modules? Uh, well, you have the standard modules that are actually not really modules, but action plugins, but they appear as modules if you use them. Um, and then the, the ones that are interesting, uh, yeah, Win Command and Win Shell, obviously. The difference is that Win Shell is actually PowerShell, and Win Command is um, yeah command of exe I guess um, which means that a lot of things you cannot do in win command properly so I probably use win shell it's not similar to, to unix so in win command you don't even have dig because dig is actually part of the shell uh, it's not a command so you probably use win shell for most of the stuff anyway um, you have win copy, win template and is there something that everything is win underscore because these are PowerShell modules um, we had to give them and put them in a different namespace, which I think is unfortunate. But if, you, if they would be exactly the same, you would have confusion because the options are not always exactly the same. Um, so yeah, there we go. What is interesting, Win service for, for managing services, the Win updates already mentioned. Win reboot, which we don't have for Unix yet. Uh, we should have this for Unix, I'm working on it. 
But when reboot actually do, does a proper reboot and waits until it comes back. What we still are lacking in win reboot and what we also need in the Unix version of it is checking if it really rebooted and not simply disappeared and came back. In. So we just have to check the, the uptime. Um, this is something that we're working on. Uh, win package, win MSI is going away. It's being replaced by win package. Uh, because this is actually unimportant and this one isn't, or not completely. Um, when chocolatey is very interesting. If you start with Windows or you're managing Windows desktops for, for people you know, when chocolatey is actually like a repository and a command to install packages and update packages. And most of these packages are open source, but that <coughs> has to be Adobe uh, PDF or uh, Adobe Acrobat. Well, there are like fake packages running on this. What? There are like fake packages. You try to install it and then still the, the win chocolate needs to go to internet and if you're in enterprise then you are behind firewalls and yes. you cannot go to internet, it doesn't it's work. It's true. It, it actually downloads the package is actually a, 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 like some sort of playbook that actually yeah. executes yeah. the... And, and it does contain the checksum of the file so that the one you download is the one you need. But, but you don't have an internet connection. No, you, in yeah. fact, you can set up your own chocolatey server. It's actually not chocolatey. Is not actually. Yeah, but some pa packages are like fake. The package itself wants to go to the internet. Ah, Even yeah. if you download the chocolatey package, in the package there is some script that downloads a zip file from the internet. And probably the because of binary they're not allowed to do probably, yeah, yeah. The, the, the guy behind chocolatey, you should discuss with him. He's also involved with Ansible because okay. he also provides feedback to us and we can ask him questions about some of these things. He's very active. He was a file beat uh, guy and he said, yeah. yeah, this is the normal way we do it in chocolate media. <laughs> it's not necessarily like that, but uh, maybe for, for legal issues. Yeah. I think, yeah, that's what he said. It's mostly used yeah. for legal. Uh, but it's similar to homebrew on the Mac, right? Yeah. So you have uh, a way to install freeware with, with, uh, without downloading packages manually and opening up uh, a zip yeah. file or yeah. a disk image and then double clicking install yes yeah. yes yes <laughs> yeah it, it, it actually works like that and some of these installers they install a desktop shortcut others don't do it and chocolatey doesn't care so that's one of the ongoing things with chocolatey should chocolatey also add or remove those shortcuts and should you be able to influence that at the moment it's not possible so i and ants will have to remove shortcuts that i don't want or add shortcuts that i do want but anyway the chocolatey related stuff um, when reg edit is an important one, unfortunately it's only for updating a single registry entry, so if you have to have 10 of these, you have to make 10 <coughs> connections. Um, when reg merge is the solution for that, but that one is not either important and this one has to be rewritten. So this one is something that I would like to work on for, for the, the elementary school that I, I help on it. We have win firewall to enable or disable firewall and we have win firewall rule to manage rules which was also completely rewritten now to, to use PowerShell objects. Um, when get URL, when URI, when PL execute, I think. When schedule task, yeah, for those times you need to run something in privilege mode, so no, 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 no necessary. Creating shares, when DSC is an important one. Um, I think that's it. Uh, when wait for is a nice one. Um, because obviously wait for is uh, specific for Unix and you may want to have the same thing on Windows. For the stuff where you test over the network it's not really necessary, but for, the for things like I'm waiting for a file to appear or disappear or things like that, which wait for also supports, you need to have it on Windows as well. And I am actually waiting for this one also su to support events, so that you can actually wait for certain events to happen on Windows and then continue, which is something very nice. And then something we wrote for the elementary school is Wake on LAN. I first started with implementing Wake on LAN as a Python module. But since Wake on LAN only works on the broadcast domain, so you have to be on the system inside of the network, and my laptop is usually at home, uh, it, it's nice to be able to delegate that to a Windows machine in that network, because the elementary school doesn't have any Windows machines. It does have its Synology NAS, but it's not really Linux. Uh, it doesn't have these commands and stuff. Just put a Raspberry Pi in there somewhere. Yeah. You could run Docker on it, but just having a Docker image in, in order to enable to wake systems, I don't know. I'm going to set up a PFSense uh, firewall there, so that would probably be my best next thing. Anyway, so my use case is managing, it used to be managing desktops at the school, but we did a call for new hardware or old, old hardware to parents. 
and we got, I told, uh, I told just yet that we got uh, 17 ThinkPad laptops from a company and 14 very nice desktops, engineering desktop with 16 gigabyte RAM. Is it in the oh, so, yeah. so we got very nice laptops and desktops. We could offer all of the teachers a laptop and a new desktop in the, in the classroom. All of them had Windows 7. So it took me some time to update it to Windows 10, which is still possible until the end of the year. So if you still have old machine with Windows 7 on it, you just have to say you have some disabilities, and then you can download the installer for people with disabilities. My disability is I don't like mushrooms, I don't eat mushrooms. You don't like um, Windows. So, and then you can upgrade what? <laughs> My disability, I don't like Windows. <laughs> <laughs> and then you can still for free update to Windows 10 until the end of this year. So we were lucky to still be able to do that. Because we have, um, we have uh, put everything on Windows 10 because it's easier if everything is the same. And we are still being able to update our systems until 2025 or something, I don't know. Windows 7 is almost uh, done. So this is what a typical, this is our, our computer room. Um, like this. And these are all uh, you know, Windows 10. And then obviously that's the typical thing in, in uh, in schools, you have those individual classrooms, and that's why I wrote the Wake Alarm module. I didn't want to go to each classroom to turn it on or to sit there. That's how I did it in the beginning. In the beginning, at the school, they had two times a year, they had this where parents could <coughs> help out um, painting walls and stuff like that. I'm not uh, very good at uh, doing things with my hands, so I started help with uh, fixing computers. Uh, but then I could only do, for those three hours, I could only do one or two machines because you can't do them in parallel. Uh, and obviously if you can turn them on and then use them, then uh, that's fixed. Here it still states that we have about 60, we had about 60 unmanaged machines uh, with all different kinds of uh, Windows versions. Everybody was using admin rights. There was a lot of strange software, things like, uh, you know, those those uh, things that help you search on the internet that take over your homepage and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, so we really started from scratch. We updated them, we, we cleaned them up, we updated them to Windows 10. Uh, there was one guy who was doing all of this stuff on a Thursday morning, Mr. Willy, uh, and he's, uh, he's in his 70s, which is he's a really nice guy. He knows everything around the school, and we started doing a lot of things. We, we upgraded the network to gigabit, uh, uh, because of uh, we want to use media that is centralized and not having still CDs and, uh, and DVDs. Um, so we did a lot of stuff. We, we installed a NAS, we upgraded to Gigabit, we fixed the cabling, we, well, I can't remember. we, we added with Wi Fi, which was there uh, before as well. Um, well. Let's see, uh, is there something else? Ah, this is actually. That. Now we have tablets as well, which I cannot manage with Ansible yet. Um, <laughs> but uh, luckily we kept it very simple for, uh, if we have to install some new stuff, we have to do it tablet with tablet, but we put them out, we do it with five people and we, we actually have an ICT working group and there are five dads who help out with some of the stuff, which is nice to do because if you do have to do it by yourself, it uh, becomes dull sometimes. So, what do we do for managing, for instance, I, I kept it simple, I didn't want to make it one big playbook that does everything, because that's also not very feasible, uh, sometimes you only have to do specific stuff. So, this is the, the set of playbooks that we have, we have a simple host.ini file, I don't see a real point in creating a YAML file, because it's very, very simple, I can show it to you. Uh, we have a GitHub repository with all our stuff on it, so if you go to chromebean slash ansible, you will find all the stuff, so if you want to reuse something or you find something that is interesting, you can do it. Um, we used to do remote desktop until Microsoft made it almost impossible to do remote desktop on Windows Home because what we did was yeah, we, we set some registry entries and then it, it worked, but it's not allowed if your license doesn't have it. And then they removed that DLL, so you cannot do it anymore. And that's when we started to use Tide VNC or Tiger VNC on Windows. But um, and it's nice to have both of them as well because sometimes after an upgrade, the remote desktop doesn't work anymore. With Windows 10, every six months they upgrade, and WinRAR doesn't work anymore, and the remote desktop doesn't work anymore on Windows Home because they disabled it again. And then it's nice to still be able to go by VNC and enable it again. 
And it's really strange that Microsoft disabled WinRM. Maybe they don't expect people on desktops to en enable it. Maybe it's a security uh, concern that they have. I hope they don't stop supporting WinRM on, uh, on Windows Home because then they're totally screwed. Um, still, what do we have? Actually, this is something very nice. I have a collect.yaml. And it's something that I also use at customers if they don't have a complete inventory of their, of their uh, infrastructure. Um, obviously, I need to be able to go to all of these machines, but the collect.yaml actually makes a CSV file out of facts from that system. So it can list the operating system versions, IP addresses, and some other stuff. And it actually maintains that CSV file. So it updates, updates the entries in that CSV file to the line <coughs> file. It's very simple, but once you have the CSV file, you give it to the, the person that hired you and showed them, hi, here's your complete inventory, and now you can see which systems are still outdated and stuff like that. We use this to see which systems don't have the latest updated windows, for instance. So this is another collection than the facts from Ansible? No, no, these are the Ansible facts that we actually put in a CSV file. You can catch them also. We catch them also. We also catch them, but oh, okay. this collector's YAML actually says, no, 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 you have to get them again. Okay. Yeah, we, we cache them because it's nice to be able to run this also uh, from the cache, but also because for the wait on long uh, playbook, I actually use the MAC address from that cache. I used to have it in my host.ini, but actually I don't need it. But once I connect, I have it in my cache and I use that from my cache. So that, that's, that's also nice to do. Um, the cleanup is actually before we accept the system, I look at what software is installed and I put all of these software that I don't want in that cleanup and then I run it and it removes all the software that I don't want. It's like the, uh, you have this, those, you have the Google plugin, that, that's one of the things that was installed on a lot of those systems. And, and the, the CC cleaner and stuff like that, so we remove all that stuff. <laughs> um, users is to manage the users and the groups, so we have a few groups. Um, well, host groups, and depending if the machine is, 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 a, is a teacher machine or it's in the classroom, for children or it is in the, in the computer room, uh, different users are being created. So we have a, a user called labeling, which doesn't have a password for labeling. Um, and, for, yeah, and so this, 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 this takes care of that. We have config, which does everything for shares, file associations. Uh, power management, which is important as well for the school. Uh, desktop does all the desktop related stuff, so we add shortcuts. We actually make it impossible for them to remove those shortcuts because we put them in the public, uh, in, in the public folder, which all the administrator can, can actually put stuff. We change look and feel. Some of those things are not, not possible in Windows that I would like to do. For instance, for the smaller children, it's nice to have a big mouse point uh, because they usually are confused with it. Even I am sometimes confused where a mouse is, so it really helps them. And that's something that I also do, but I still do that manually if we have a new machine. Um, software management is actually to make sure that we install the correct needed software with Chocolaty. Most, I think everything comes from Chocolaty, except the printer. The, the printer installer, we cannot automate it easily. Um, let me see, OneDrive we disable it because they, they always click on it and it's always there. We always have to disable it again. Windows actually enables it again after an update. And then winrm.yaml is actually to, um, to enable winrm again using when ps execute is not correct. So that one you can, I, I use that one if winrm is still, is, is again disabled after an update. Now I can do it with VNC as well, but I still have to log on and start the stuff. And with the winrm.yaml you can do it automatically. But then you need your Windows machine to go to the other Windows machine. Yes, so I need to have at least one Windows machine in order to... Uh, I would like to fix it so that we can do it natively on Python. Um, it's in the master branch. Hmm? The WinRM YAML is not uh, in the master branch. Ah, uh, it's probably the test directory then. Because it's not something I often use. Uh, or maybe I didn't check it in, maybe I can check. <laughs> Uh, let me check afterwards. Um, <laughs> let me see. So the things that I couldn't do yet, and these are very silly things, huh? like the manage tiles. I cannot manage those windows tiles, and I really hate it because there are a lot of things that distract children. If you stand up the Windows machine, you open it, you see games. They are not actually installed, but once you click on it, it will automatically install it for that user. 
So we remove those tiles and I still have to do it manually. So I cannot automatically disable them. There is a way to do it in PowerShell, it's not convenient. So, and I, now one of the dads this year is actually a Windows engineer. And so I asked him <laughs> to, to look at it. I said, this is all not possible. He said, no, 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 it must be possible. And so he's now interested to, to, to help me with that. Uh, something that's also uh, very frustrating, if you know Windows, you will know this. Um, by default, if you have an Intel graphics driver, you can have this combination of keys that will that will uh, rotate your screen, and people always press those keys. And they don't know how to go back, so we disable that. Uh, something else we disable is actually the, the language settings. In Belgium, the, for Dutch-speaking people, uh, by default, if you if you buy a, a, a Dutch Windows, it's a Dutch Windows with a QWERTY keyboard, so we always have to create a new, uh, a new uh, internationalization or whatever um, for, for the for the SFT keyboard. The problem is that it always comes back yeah. after an update, so we we always have to remove it again. And the problem is that if it, if if you have two of them, there is a combination yeah. key that will change your keyboard, and they also don't know how to go back. So then they are get called because suddenly it becomes QWERTY, and they don't know how to. To fix that. The worst thing about it is that it can be changed per application. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, it's true. Yeah, yeah. So the switch in our country of the crap. That would be a fix as well. Yeah. <laughs> With Ansible. <laughs> um, group policies would be nice to have a solution for that because with group policies you can actually control certain stuff that they that and group policies are possible even if you don't have an active directory. There are ways to do it, but uh, we don't have a solution for that at the moment within Ansible, but also I have to investigate some time for that. But it would be nice at the school to, to make sure that students cannot change certain stuff, because they can still, as a user layering, they can still modify stuff that we would prefer not to do it. Luckily, we haven't seen it yet, but uh, it's still possible. Um, management of tablets, I, I don't have to go into that if you're interested. Ask me. We also help with technology choices, and we're actually looking now at a new doorbell, which is voice over IP based, and we're looking at voice over, over IP uh, telephones uh, because they're paying too much to our telco for this. And we also started to introduce scratch programming for children starting from the second grade, twiddly uh, really year. Um, so as soon as they can can read, they can actually start. Uh, doing scratch, and that's very nice, because I once replaced the teacher, at the teacher's day, they, they, they asked parents to do one or two hours of, uh, of uh, teaching, and I did actually scratch with, with my daughter, with the class of my daughter, and it was really, really fun to see. Then, the, the more important, I don't know if you have still time, but it's the more important part of the, uh, because this I put it at the end, so that you cannot say no. Um, <laughs> How much time do you need now? Uh, maybe 10 minutes. Uh, so, um, as I told you, there is a very interesting use case at Cisco where they have, the, the TAC is actually technical, I don't know what it stands for, but it's a technical uh, technical assistance sense. Voila, that's probably it. Um, that's actually what all the customers call when they have advanced problems with Cisco, uh, with Cisco hardware or software. Um, and I'm now part of the ACI team, which does, which is the new networking stack, the new networking, uh, uh, the new way of doing networking. Um, the thing is, they often have problems where they don't know what causes, obviously, and they either need to try to reproduce it or have to investigate themselves what the problem is. Obviously, they cannot do it on the customer uh, production side. They have to look at their own what this problem is. If they know in advance this is a common problem, then obviously they don't have to reproduce, but in some cases they don't know in advance if it would be useful. And some of these setups, it depends on, 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 on versions that they have, the versions of the firmware, of, of, of switches and, and the software, and combinations with SEVMM or Hyper-V or VMware versions. So all of these things could be different, and you have to, if it's a software bug, you have to find and, and, and see what, what, what's happening. Um, it could take up two or three days to, to, to create a complete similar environment, because you have to install all that software manually. It could take two to three days to set up an, 
effects and damage. How do you get all this information? Because setting it up is uh, setting it or setting it up is already a major task, but getting it from your customer might be even more uh, problematic. I'm not a, a tech engineer, but they get that information. They need it if they want to reproduce it. That's, 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 if they don't get it, they can't reproduce it exactly. Yeah. That's a fact. Yeah. Uh, but it can take up to, to uh, two or three days to set up a complex environment. And I know because I've automated it and there are lots of small issues that can happen and, and things that can go wrong. And, it's, and, and or you, you do something in the, in the wrong order than, than the, the, the manual says you have to do it and then you cannot fix it anymore, you have to start from scratch, stuff like that. So there is a real um, money saver in automating this. That's, that's the first thing. First, you don't have the engineer actually doing it, it's automated. The thing is also, once it's automated, it may still take one to three hours, but the engineer can do something else. You don't, he doesn't spend the time on it either. Uh, so it's sufficient for the engineer to do, but also the hardware, so a pot, like we call it, it consists of physical switches, it consists of uh, physical systems, it consists of virtual machines. A complete pot is about, it's more than 1 million euros in, in, in money. And we have, for the ACI team, I think we have 15 of these pots. And they're not being used as efficiently, because if you have to set it up for three days, you have the engineer and you have the, the pot not available for three days, for instance. So that's also something to consider. Um, so there are things that we could improve and that's what we did now and it's, it's really making a difference. In the past, there, there was really, they have to, to think about, is this going to be useful to spend this time or not? And in the most cases, they would say, if it takes two or three days, two, three days it's probably not, uh, doesn't make sense to do it because it's a full, yeah, full time job. Um, and now they don't have to make that consideration. They can say, okay, let's start it. Let's, if, if, we, if I think it's necessary to do it, I can just start it off. I can work with the customer on that case. And then if it's not fixed within two or three hours, I can actually test it myself on our own, uh, on our own pot. If it is fixed, then it doesn't matter that it already ran. Um, and that's, that's what we actually do now. And I would like to uh, show you maybe what things we do. Uh, I, sh I should take my second laptop. <laughs> and, and we made a front end for the, for the engineers also to, in order to, uh, to, to be able to, uh, to, to select which pot they want to work on and that other people can see that this pot is actually registered for a specific user. And in fact, because these pots have so much hardware that in, not for all customer cases, all the hardware is being used, you can actually share pots with, with, uh, with engineers. So then you can also save on the number of pots you really need. Now I have to be careful, I don't know, is this... All right. Yeah, I was running, I was running. Yeah. Yep. Let's see. Hmm. Ik heb hier jouw desktop in ieder geval. Ja, yeah, I probably have to, uh, to split it. Let me first see if I can if I can log on to the system. Because the thing is, in a lab environment, it's not your typical uh, enterprise environment. It's not where, in most of the companies I work, I have a set of playbooks that take care of either the provisioning of new systems or making sure the systems are at a specific level. It, configuration-wise or, or application-wise or whatever. Um, and the inventory I have actually explains everything in that infrastructure. It could be a part of the infrastructure because maybe production and non-production is separate inventories and maybe separate uh, infrastructure. Um, but at least normally it describes everything. In my case for a lab, that's not really the case. In my case, I have scenarios. A scenario could be set up um, an Active Directory with an MS SQL and a SCVMM environment with Hyper-Vs. For that, for that setup, I only need to, to have a few systems of the whole pot that I'm going to use. And in that scenario, the inventory is generated and only contains the stuff that is really needed. Why? Because in another scenario, the same infrastructure is being used for something else. That system that, that is running Windows uh, 2012 could then be used for OpenStack and it's suddenly Linux. So I cannot have a single inventory that describes my complete lab. 
because there is no complete lab, there is scenarios. <laughs> so, in fact, what we are, um, I, I haven't shared my screen, I think, let me... Yeah, uh, it is. Uh, is it readable? No, hardly. Ah, uh, and it closed my window. I have to log on first, obviously. <laughs> Ah, uh, come, come, come. Wi-Fi? Yep. So let's use the fantastic AT Computing, sponsored by AT Computing, Wi-Fi. <laughs> which is secure and very fast. <laughs> And this demonstration will work from, from the start without any problem at all. Voila. My piece of demo goes. Oh no! You can not do it. Yay! No, 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 no. It's, it works. And I'm going to Amsterdam. Look at that. I don't know what this is doing here, but still. Um, okay, so let's make a new session. There is nothing in here that is really uh, important because the lab obviously is completely isolated. Let me see. So... Uh, and turn off on the weekend? <laughs> <laughs> no, because the, the tax support team is 24-7. So uh, I did something wrong, the wrong system. I had it open, eh, but... Uh, you can reconnect. Yeah, but it, it closed. If it doesn't find the house, it doesn't keep your window open and it closes the window. It's a bug. I opened an issue for it 10 years ago. But, uh, um, but it's still bad, isn't it? But putty is nice in general. Eh? It's, it's only... So, so if, you, if we would look at... So we have different scenarios. And here you can see some of these scenarios. We call them task tasks, which is a bad name. I, I prefer scenario. Uh, we have some, some of these scenarios. One of them is, for instance, um, doing something with SCVMM. It's actually a long scenario. In the first part, we actually install a few VMs which it, have an Active Directory in it. Uh, <coughs> like I told you, an MSSQL and an SCVMM, which is necessary to have in Hyper-V environment because we have to want to integrate ACI with Hyper-V because customers do that. Um, the second step is actually setting up uh, the Hyper-V and registering one or more Hyper-Vs to that SCVMM. And the third step is then um, creating a complete network stack, which all, already has to be there, because you have to run task 60, 61 first, <laughs> um, if it hasn't been done. And then uh, also creating a VM, and then testing if that VM actually works and, uh, on that network. If it can find that network, because it's different, different pieces, that the Hyper-V is a physical machine, um, and the network is, is somewhere else. Uh, it's also not a physical machine. And so the playbook looks like this. And because we used roles, it's actually very simple. VMware, it's installing all the VMwares. Well, it's creating the VM. If it, if it already exists, it removes it all, also. Um, the, the Windows part is actually a role that's called Windows Common, which does the common stuff for Windows, which is installing a few tools for debugging, like Wireshark and stuff like that. Um, the WinDC is then actually creating the AD server. And for instance, I can show you how we would do this. Um, I'm just picking one of them, uh, uh, one that is very Windows-like. In this case, for instance, we enabled some features, and we have them. Is it readable? Should I just make it a little bit larger? A bit bigger. Yep. Um, so that you have a sense of how you would do this, and it looks very much like what you would do on, on Unix. Um, but I want to show you that it's actually actually like that. So here we run win feature, 
we include the management tools and we say install AD domain server and DNS, which is all both necessary. In fact, in the, in the guide I had, I also had to install these three, but these three are also already included with AD domain server, so I, I removed them, but I still have this node there. Then I have to create a primary zone, and we I think the I think we have a module that can do this, but not exactly like what we needed. So what we do here is um, we run um, some commentlet that already exists for this purpose, and then we check if it already worked or not, so that it's you can run it again and it will not try to create it again and give an error. But in, in our case, actually, my 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 colleague said no, 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 it doesn't have to be repeatable. It's really not necessary because we only do it once and we start from scratch. But for testing, if I have to try it again and I don't want to start from scratch, it's actually helpful to also have this. So I try to make it as repeatable as possible. And here is, for instance, um, how you set up AD. And it doesn't look very nice because it's PowerShell, but that you, you can get used to that. Um, and the command that is called install ADS forest with then the... Uh, the database where it, it needs to store its stuff locally and the NetBIOS name, which is actually the domain control name, the domain name. Um, and then we create a desktop icon. Why? Because that's actually, if you have to manage AD on that system afterwards, it's nice to not have to look for which was the tool again that where I have to create that user. It's already there. So I try for each of the systems that have a specific purpose to also add desktop shortcuts, so that the engineers that have to troubleshoot something don't have to mess around. Process Explorer, um, the tool that does something like s on Windows, they are also on the desktop available for engineers to, to, to troubleshoot easily. Uh, Wireshark, as I already mentioned, is also on the desktop available for troubleshooting. And then we reboot the system. Well, when do we reboot the system? When AD install is defined, which is somewhere in a variable that uh, that is set here if AD was actually installed and if uh, AD install changed. The AD install could not, could not exist if Windows NDTS was already created. Then that's why I have to check if it was defined and if it was changed. So this was created installing AD. It's not that difficult. Huh? It was five tasks and I have an AD, a working AD environment. Um, and for all of these things, it looks, it looks as similar as that. For instance, if you go to roles windows comment, which I think is also an interesting one, you can see here what all the things we do. We install 7-zip, we install, uh, we, we change some explorer stuff because by default windows tries to hide extensions and hide certain files and stuff like that. Our engineers, they know what they're doing. They should have a full view of everything. Firewall, we disable the firewall in this case to make sure that the firewall is not an issue. I wasn't in favor of that, but I listened to what my customer says and these, these are the experts. So. They don't want to mess around with this. Keyboard settings, I, I do enable the Belgian keyboard because otherwise I have to type QWERTY on the Belgian keyboard for myself, which is a nice thing that you can do. PuTTY, RDP, Sys internals, uh, Windows features that we additionally add. And we also <coughs> do some Windows updates, although I think I've disabled that for now because that's not that important. Um, and I can show you one of these. Eh? It, it looks you will recognize this kind of stuff, uh, Windows Common maybe. Uh, let's see, um, Sys internals. What do you do for Sys internals? In my case, I'm not using Chocolati. Normally you would use Chocolati, but we don't have internet access directly. So we download it from an internal source where we put this binaries. And so we also have to unzip it. We use win unzip. It's not, uh, we actually add the directory where we put the files to the path, WinPath is actually also a very nice one because you can actually influence the default path on the system, either for the user or for the system wide. I think you have three, three different levels. Can't remember what the third was, but it's all documented. Um, and this is actually adding elements in that Win, Windows path because you can also override the path variable, obviously, but we want to manage what's in there, uh, which is actually quite nice that you can do it like this. And then you, we copy the PS execute because for some reason, this here is not working, and I haven't figured out why, but it, it's been added to the path and still it's not working. I also added to, uh, to see Windows PS execute. For PS execute, it doesn't work, and I think it's because the path is not being used to find PS execute to exit. Uh, but for all the others, it does work uh, adding it to the path. And then I make two shortcuts, one for Proc Ex Process Explorer, 
which is a very nice tool on Windows. So it's not strange that Microsoft bought the, the guy and, and the company. And uh, Procomon is actually something like asterisk. So you can see everything that's happening low level and you can even filter out certain stuff. So if, if something is not working, that's what I do on Windows. Uh, so I don't know what else I could do except show you the interface that we created that was custom written for them. This is the one, actually it's not only used in EMEA, it's also used in the US and we're probably going to use it as well in, um, in India. And it looks like this and we have someone who has been improving the, the GUI but the bubbles are too big now. They should be a little bit smaller, but you can see who registered a specific, uh, a specific pod. And if you register it, then these uh, buttons become available. And the login button is you go into the ACI framework. Inventory shows you all of the, the, the stuff that's in there. Let me show you. Uh, the, the, this is actually what you could do. And it is now running something. In the weekends, I test all my scenarios multiple times. Um, during the day. So that's why now something is running and you can see here it's cleaning the leaves and the spines that has started doing that. And in the meantime it's also waiting for the APIC which is uh, it's a man well it's a, it's a system that is part of your ACI setup which manages your switches. Um, that, that one is being installed and we have multiple of those. This is actually something quite nice let me show you that as well. Um, if we install physical machines you don't know what the program is, it's only going to take a few minutes. If you install a physical machine, you have this management card where you can say boot, uh, stop, start, or boot this ISO image or pixie boot. Um, in our case, we do pixie boot, but the moment that it starts to run, we, have no, we don't know what's happening. We can open the console by SSHing or by opening a, a GUI that shows us the console, but we still want to see if it fails, how it fails without having to do a lot of uh, stuff. Now, what we did is we actually um, let me let me show you the role for Pixie Boot. Um, we actually are running expect. Uh, let me see how we do it. Yeah, we use cobbler. I would like to get rid of it, but we're still using cobbler. We are changing IMC is actually the the management board in those uh, Cisco systems. It's on HP, it's called ILO, on IBM it's called RSA, on Dell, I can't remember what it was. Yeah, I don't know. Voilà. Um, and in this case, it, it uses an XML-based uh, way of doing it. It's similar to ILO, and here you can say, power down the server, configure serial on LAN, configure the console redirection so that we can see it on the serial on LAN, we config, configure the pixie boot, and then we power up the server. That's what we do here. And then, I do a pixie boot wait, because if it's pixie booting, it's fine, but I want to be sure that it's pixie booting. If it's not pixie booting, it might be going into the old installation and that's what we have to find out. And so what I did was I created uh, for the different types of installations, because for Windows it's doing something different than, for instance, uh, for the APIC installation, we created the different pixie boot wait um, tasks. And for instance, uh, the wait, for the epic provisioning for instance we actually are calling expect because it's the easiest to do there is an expect module but the expect module is very very simple you cannot do complex stuff and so what we're doing here is we're actually logging all the stuff to a file and that file is available to us every time we do a pixie boot installation and that file actually shows you the bios booting and everything else um, and we do that by SSHing to the imc and then logging in with the password and then uh, type in connect host to see the console and then we we expect that press any key to continue is, is uh, shown because the apic installer requires a key to be pressed we send we, we press that key and then we wait for starting apic installer to start off and then we know that the pixie installation has run if it didn't finish within 10 minutes we know something has failed and we fail in Ansible. And this is how we do it. Uh, don't, I didn't find a better way. The expect module is, is not very good. Um, and the same thing for a simple uh, IMC DHCP, for instance. Here we do the same thing and we wait for client IP or DHCP IP to 
to be shown, and this shows us that the pixie, the, the pixie has started. It got an IP address, and um, it can can continue. Uh, and it's very simple, but it's very useful to be able to still do something like this, even though it's not the Ansible way of doing things. It's still automating. Voila. So I don't know if there are any questions to this. Um, I did have some slides prepared of how the Windows community is working, but we can do that over food or after this presentation. We still want to do a presentation from Jan Piet, I think. Yeah, a short one about and what we have. And I have, I have some slides available yeah. or some new stuff that might be interesting for those that are interested to know what's coming. I will, I will hurry up and I will get back to you. Or you, want, yeah, or you no. let, let, let's have a drink and then you can continue and then you can Okay. Then we don't have to reset everything uh, over there. Okay. Mm -hmm. We now switch on the lights. So thank you. Thank you.